So yeah, no evidence of disease. So that's amazing. It's been five years, and um, glad to be back. So I was a little bit slowed down, but in the last few years. So Enso is uh, getting back in progress. This is a joint work with Tight Thunderstorm, and uh, we've been working on this for a few years. So how many people have seen this before? This idea of the spectrum of programming. A few people have seen it. Okay. Um, I'm going to go through it again because I like it. It's a, it's a spectrum that says how to implement something versus what you're implementing. And what is a specification and how is the implementation. And so there's um, this idea of verification that Adam told us about and Benjamin Pierce told us about, um, which you prove properties of your uh, how and your what. You have to implement the how, you have to implement the what, and you have to implement the, the, the verification. So it's a lot of work. Um, there's this other idea, which is synthesis, that's been talked about over the years. And it uh, goes directly from the what to the how. You generate the how from the what. If you have a complete specification, then you can generate code sometimes. Um, that's very, very hard. Harder than verification even, I think. Um, so that's not very common either. But there's been this other idea, which is verification light, that has been very successful in computer science. And it has to do with type checking, bug finding, race detection, all kinds of static analysis of a restricted specification. Okay, so you're, you're not verifying full specifications, you're verifying partial specifications. And those can be fully automated, and they're very successful. Um, it's kind of the bread and butter of PLDI and Popple for the last 10 years, I think. But uh, the idea that I'm interested in is the idea of synthesis light, which is just like verification light, where you restrict the specifications to be domain-specific specifications. So they're restricted. They aren't predicate logic anymore, they're restricted specifications, and this is kind of what model-driven development is trying to do, I think. They're trying to um, talk about programs in restricted uh, specification languages, which is what models are. Models are descriptions, well, when they're really good, they're descriptions of what the program should do, not how to do it, and you can generate code from that sometimes. So I'm trying to get people to stop working on verification. <laughs> Just quit it. We don't, we don't, you know, uh, that we need to do um, verif uh, synthesis instead. And all kinds of synthesis. And there's lots of papers that are starting to be done about synthesis of various kinds. And so um, that would be great. Now, that's obviously tongue in cheek. I don't really mean for you to stop working on verification. But I do want you to think about synthesis. So there's another idea here, which is preventing bad versus enabling good. And preventing bad is, is bug finding, race detection, type checking. You're, you're basically analyzing the program to find bad things and, and eliminate them. And that's very successful as well. Um, but it's not going to get us to a better way of programming, necessarily. I mean, you know, the, the preventing bad. Whereas enabling good is about new languages, new ideas, new features, new say ways of saying what. Um, so preventing bad, the advantages are, are great. It's easy to do. You don't even under need to understand the program that you're analyzing. You don't need to understand the domain. You can just analyze it, find problems, and you're done, and you publish. Um, whereas enabling good is a lot more difficult. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm interested in this problem of uh, writing many, many repeated similar pieces of code. How many people have ever written the same similar piece of code before, <laughs> right? Uh, it's, it's quite common. And the names change, and the constraints change, 
but the basic structure of the code remains the same over and over again. And so we need to figure out some way to, to deal with this. Um, and here's the picture I try and do to show how w one way of looking at this, that there's requirements, which is what you need to do. And everyone sits in the room and figures out what the requirements are. And then we go off and we figure out strategies for how to solve it. And then we write the code. And that's a, a fairly standard, I think, approach. Um, and then you get behavior. Now, the problem is that if you make a small change to the strategy, if you go back in the room and you say, oh, we should have done it this way, we should have done it, you know, no SQL with, you know, this strategy and this thing, then you have to throw out all your code. Because it's very different from what it was before. And the things that were the same are no longer the same because they're embedded in all this stuff that's different. And so this is what I call chaos. It's a small change to the input has a huge change on the output, right? That's, that's the, uh, the problem with that. So here's one way to, 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 to not do that, is to reify the what somehow, and then reify the strategy. That's the key thing. If you can reify means write it down formally, specify it somehow, then you could generate the application code, perhaps, um, and get the behavior. And so if you change the, here's one picture of this, that the requirements go in to some kind of a problem specific specification of what the problem is. That's the what that's been, all of the implementation details have been removed and that's what you call a specification. And then you have technical requirements that say how you're gonna do it. And that's the, the general strategies and that those things together let you get behavior. So one example is a, a, a data model and a data manager making behavior. And that's what you do when you use SQL, right? You write your data model at a very high level and then you have this very powerful strategy. You turn on the engine, you crank it, and it generates a powerful implementation strategy for managing your data without you're having to worry about how it happens, right? You know, how many people know how the SQL works inside, maybe one or two, right? But it's amazing, right? It does a great job. So um, there are other data managers. So the other thing you can do when you do this is you can, you can kind of add features in here without changing the what, right? You could make this a distributed data model. You could make this a secure data model. You could make it, you know, all kinds of different things. A, you know, logging data model. You could make it have a um, notifications of everything. You could make it be, you know, huge scaling, whatever. If, if you can do it right, that's, that's the vision. So, um, okay, so here's um, what ENSO does is we start I'll just point out grammars here. Um, we have this idea that um, you can take um, like data managers and data models and hook them up to grammars and presentation engines and things and get rid of the glue code. So you're doing DSLs, but you're not doing them in the way we're doing them now. DSLs are often like Yak and SQL and Makefile. They're all small programs solve a prob part of the problem, but they need lots of glue code to be connected to everything else. So my idea is to take the uh, DSLs and make them a little bigger so they're big enough to touch each other, right? The, the m data model can touch the grammar and know how to, the grammar knows how to write into the data model directly without any glue code. So that's how this does it. So imagine that you have a a data model that defines points with an X and a Y field, then this is a grammar that says, well, make a point when you see an open paren and set the X field to an integer and a, then read a comma and then set the Y field to an integer and read a, read a close paren. And that's got syntax for writing the point and code for generating the point. It calls the constructor with an X and a Y field. So there's no glue code there. Um, and it reads directly into the point. There's no abstract syntax tree that you have to then convert into your data model. 
and it's bidirectional, you can print too. You could say, okay, if I've got a point, you could say, oh, well, a point prints out by writing an open paren and then writing the x field of the point as an integer and writing a comma and writing the y field as an int. And uh, so that's cool. So here's a, a model that I've shown before, a state machine model that just as a small model to get started, you, you, you write the syntax this way. So I'm doing external DSLs. I'm not doing embedded DSLs. These are external DSLs. They live in their own files and you parse them. Um, start state, open, state open, state closed, state locked with transitions between them. And here's a grammar that will parse that file. So you say start and it reads in the root state. So there's a start state, which is one of the states that's named by it, it being uh, open. And so that means go and look up in state sub it, which is state sub open, and set that to the start state. Can't do that yet because we haven't read in the states, so that's got to be delayed in the parsing. Um, but then we read in states, and we read in s for each state, and that makes a state, and it makes a state and gets its name as a symbol and reads a bunch of out transitions, which are keys, um, sets the out transitions to key, and that does on event go to, and then again, root states of it. That's the name of the state we're going to, open, locked. And it can't resolve any of those names until it's read everything in and made all the states. It's made the state machine and made three states. And then it can look up it sub open and set the start state to the open state. And it can look up the links and set them. So that's kind of nice. That's what I mean by it kind of the grammar knows how to write into the data model. So here's the actual data model um, that it is being written into. It's got a class machine with a start state and states and the bang, I'll explain in a second, um, class state with a machine. Um, that ought to have an inverse. Hmm. Yeah, well, I'm going to leave it out. So this has a, this is the machine is the inverse of the, uh, the states field. They're inverses of each other in relational modeling. It's got a name, a set of out transitions, and a set of in transitions. And uh, a transition is an event that has a string, and it has a, a from, which does have an inverse, which is the out, and a state, which is the inverse, which is the in, um, called from and to. And so those are all connected up in a graph, right? And um, if we want to look at one of these, we can talk about my the topic of my talk, which is uh, that's too small, I think, is it? No? Let me uh, go and load one of these things. So, um, Here's a door state machine. Anybody read that? Yeah, that's right. So there's a there's an actual state machine that was um, implemented as one of these things. And so what I've got is a um, a new way of presenting state machines, which is using stencils. And what they do is they have this idea of a diagram. So this is just a diagram. It's got boxes and arrows and labels and things like that. It's, there's a model for what kind of diagrams you can create. And then what I do is I take this uh, state machine instance here and um, which is an instance of this data model. And what I do is I take these classes and I map them into the diagram language. And that's what I call a stencil. It's a mapping from some abstract model into a diagram. 
okay? And we're going to go and look at that in a minute just to get a feel for it. But it um, lets us make diagrams that are specialized, right? They, you can't make a diagram that is uh, anything other than um, boxes, and circles, and, and arrows, which is what a state machine has. You can't add a triangle in there. It's, you know, this isn't a, a generic diagram anymore, and it's a specialized diagram. And you can move these arrows around to, you know, to make them be wherever you want them. And, uh, so this is pretty nice because it knows what it's doing. Yeah. I think I might be getting simpler images and slower than the other. Yeah. Um, yeah, this is built using the same language. Um, yeah, so we're. Actually using it to write your answers yourself. Like yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So we're going to go and look at how it's built. Right? So, so you, you understand this stuff here. Right? This is the, the stuff I've been talking about before. And this is the new thing, which is this visual presentation. And we're going to go and look at that. Um, why don't we do that right now? Let's see. Here's the state machine, and so it has a uh, state machine schema, which is exactly what that is, and that's typed in there. So I created that. That allowed me to store state machines, and it does have the inverse here that says that machines are the inverse of states. And then I did a state machine grammar, which is also there, just to see that it is the actual code is exactly what I had on the slide reads in state machines. But then I did a stencil that allows it to write it out to a diagram. And so what this says is that a diagram of a machine is, well, it's a, it's a, it's a constructor function, basically, from the machine to the diagram. And so it says, make a graph, because that's what I have here. This is the, the graph mode in the in the diagram at language, right? You have graphs, you have grids, you have different kinds of diagrams. It happens to be a graph-based diagram. And it says, well, for each state in the machine.states, so then I need to have my uh, data model up too, right? So the machine has states, a list of them, that's what the star means. Uh-oh, I lost my... I don't know if I'm going to be able to get all this stuff on the screen. Yeah, maybe. Okay. So um, for each state in the machine.states, make a label and uh, state, and then draw this oval, okay, with a line width. And this is actually... Uh, I don't know if that's working right now. <coughs> if the state is a machine dot start state, then it's supposed to be a dark oval, and it's otherwise it's a one. So I might have lost that in the recent chaos. And then put the text inside the oval with a bold uh, of the state name. So these are all things that are coming from the uh, the data model, right? So it's kind of writing it directly from the data model into this diagram language. And then the thing is, how do you create the links? Well, once it's created the states, it's labeled them as a state. Okay. And those labels get mapped from the, from the semantics of state machines, the, the data model, get mapped down to the... Uh, picture elements, the, the ovals, right? So that's the mapping that allows it to go and for each state in the state machines, make a transition object for each state dot out. State dot out is the list of out transitions. And so now we're in a mode where we're working on a transition. Um, and the transition event is the label and the transition from, that's a, that's a semantic reference to 
the source state, but it gets mapped down to the diagram. And the pr two is a semantic reference to the target state. It gets mapped down to its oval, and then a line is drawn between them with an arrow and an event as its label. And so that makes the uh, labeled arrow. Now, that's 15 lines of code. And I claim that that is a complete uh, diagram editor for um, these state machines, which, yes? Yes. So it remembers. So this is not just a function. It's a, it's a semantics. It's a relational mapping. Yes, it goes completely bidirectional. And it knows things like, well, if we have iteration over states, then that means there could be fewer states or more states. So it'll add, and this isn't all done yet, but this is the design, I'm telling you. So I'm, I'm trying to get the design right. That will tell you that you can add new states or you could delete states. So every one of these things gets a, a delete button. And there it is, delete state. Yeah. So that'll delete it. And uh, or you can create a state, de delete a transition, create a transition. So those are, um, and you can change the name um, to something else. I don't know, zoom. And that writes it back into the back from the diagram up, it writes it into the data model. So there's a direct connection between them. And my argument is that, I sa as I said, there's enough information in here to know how to edit every aspect of the semantics, pretty much. And how to edit the fields, and how to add new states, and how to add new transitions. And you don't need to specify any menus here, because they're implicit in the iterations, right? You can just figure them out by looking at what's going on in the tra you look at the transformation and that tells you what kind of changes could happen. So that's why I claim this to be a complete application specification for editing these kind of diagrams. And then when you save the diagram, it actually writes it out back to the file that it came from. So if I save this, it's going to write it back into the uh, door state machine model. Well, looks like it didn't do it. Oh, yeah. It wrote it into the state machine model new. Yeah, so there. The state's named Zoom now. And it's, it's renamed in the lookup, right? Because it knows that there's a connection to that when it wrote it out. So it consistently renamed it. Um, I didn't want to overwrite my actual state machine, so I wrote it out to a new file. And it wrote it the positions of where those nodes are into a positions file that is a separate thing that the diagram knows about. But the, uh, um, the, the, the source file is uncontaminated, yeah. If I rename it to close, that's a good question. I should get an error. Let's try changing this guy. No, it's going to let me do that. Uh, yeah, so it actually knows. So, uh, let me look. Yeah, so this little thing here, I can explain these uh, annotations now. Um, this one means that it's a key. So name is a key, so it should be unique. And the data model should in in ensure that. I'm not sure why it didn't. And maybe it did, but it just wrote into the diagram, but it didn't notify. Um, these bangs are just like colons except they represent what we call the traversal. Okay, so these are graphs. And graphs are a little bit unwieldy if you can't traverse them efficiently. So what these mean 
is that you start with the state machine, the class machine, and if you iterate through all the states, and then for every state you iterate through all the transitions, the out transitions, and 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 you don't iterate through the in transitions because that's a colon, then you'll visit every object in this graph. So that's the spanning tree. Those fields define the spanning tree, which is useful to have. So that's optional, but it's 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 quite useful and it might actually be required at some point. Um, so anyway, that's uh, that's everything about the state machine example, I think. Um, and now what I want to do is, uh, well, is that going to, yeah, okay. We can do some other ones. So here's expressions. Um, and note that um, I, I didn't mention it, but there's a state machine interpreter, which is actually code. So I do write code as well. And this thing says put the current dot name, current is m dot start state. So that's a state, that's a reference to, to a state. So once you have one of these managed data models, you can just use these classes as if they were object-oriented classes and read, read and write them. So this thing um, takes a machine and gets the start state and then sends out while it's getting an input, it uh, reads the current name, um, scripts the input, and checks the current dot out. So this is the list of out states dot each, which is an iterator to transition and gives us the transition. If the transition event is equal to the input, then the current task is the transition dot two. And we break, and it goes around again. So this thing implements a, a quick state machine. Um, I don't think I need to show you that. Um, but that's Ruby code right now. Um, so this is a, a, an example, a similar example with simple expressions and expression grammar, expression um, data model, and uh, an expression interpreter, which is just a function, an uh, object-oriented representation of that. Okay, so everything's a language, and what's going on is that the, the state machine schema is what we looked at. We looked at state machine interpreter, <coughs> state machine grammar, makes the state machine DSL, basically. And uh, these things, though, are defined by their own uh, grammar. So there's a, a schema grammar and a schema schema. So to write the schema, we wrote it in a schema grammar. That was how we wrote the state machine schema. And to write the state machine grammar, we wrote that using a grammar grammar, which is uh, stored in the grammar schema. But to write schemas, we have to have a grammar for that too. So there's these four kind of core uh, schemas that um, are all interconnected. The schema schema, the grammar schema, which is the, the way of storing grammars, the grammar grammar, which is how to parse grammars, and the schema grammar, which is how to uh, parse schemas. So this thing formats into that, and this, uh, you know, it's, it's basically described and formats it all around. So I think one of my arrows is in the wrong way. So, so here it is. This is the actual schema schema. I just copied it from my source code into this presentation. Um, it says that a schema is a bunch of types, and then it's a traversal field, and a type has two subclasses. So this is another notation that I've introduced into my schema language, which allows it to be subclass. So primitive or type or class type. Primitive type just has a name, which it inherits from type. And <coughs> the schema points back to the schema, right? That's an, an inverse field, the, the inverse of schema slash types. So those are re relationally connected. And then a, a class type, a class type has supers, which has a bunch of classes, and it has subclasses, which is a bunch of classes, which is a bunch, which is supers. So those are inverse fields of each other, the subclasses and the supers. It has defined fields, which are the fields that are actually defined in this class, but the fields are computed. So this is another new notation. It's computed fields. 
it says it looks like a normal field, but it's equal to an expression. And so we said, well, go and get the supers, which is this field here, do a flat map of f dot fields. So we get all the fields of all those things, and that gets a list of lists, and we flat map it, and we union that with the defined fields, and that together is the, the fields of this class. So that's two lines implements inheritance um, in a simple way. It's not doing full object-oriented inheritance. It's just doing data inheritance. This is a data model, so that's appropriate. And then a field has a name and an owner, which is the inverse of the class. So that's a, an inverse of the, of the uh, defined field relation. It's whether it's a key. It has a type, which points to the type of the class of the field. And that has a it doesn't have an inverse, so that's OK. Um, whether it's optional, whether it's many valued, what its inverse is, which is a field, and that's optional. And its inverse is itself. So the inverse of a field is the inverse field. So that's kind of interesting. Um, maybe in di different classes, but this field here actually is the inverse of itself um, directly. And then whether it's computed, and that has its expression. And that's actually loaded from a different grammar that I imported. And I left that out. There's an import expression at the beginning of this grammar that lets me write that. And then uh, there's whether it's a, the traversal field. And so that's everything in a schema schema. But more interesting is to go and look at it over here. Because I have a stencil for schemas, and if I go and go over to my core a schema and look at its models, then I have a schema schema, and there it is. There's the uh, there's the schema of schemas written out through a stencil into a diagram. And it has all the same properties, right? I can move these things around and uh, you know, <coughs> change things and edit them and essentially add new classes, add new things. And so the idea here is that a schema, it's kind of nice actually to read it here, is a bunch of types, star. It's type and a type is uh, two subclasses, primitive and class. And a class has a bunch of defined fields, which are fields, and that's the inverse is the owner, right? So it connects up the owner and the and the schema and the types. Those those become opposite ends of the line, and so you can see that their inverse is much more readily than having to read the inverse syntax over here, right? An inverse field here, this guy here, uh, is his in own inverse, so he shows up twice, the same field. Uh, and whether it's computed is an expression. And that's not there because um, that's in the other grammar that I import. So again, so what is the, what is the, I don't have a graphical representation of stencils, but we can look at them. So what does the schema stencil look like? grammar schema, here we go. So here's the schema stencil. And it's all of 36 lines long. So again, I claim that that's a kind of a complete editor for schemas. And it says there's something similar. It says the schema is a graph, and a class is labeled with a box instead of an oval. And it's got a vertical list in it that the top is the name, the class name, which is bold. And then it's got a for each field list. So now we, we're doing an iteration inside that thing that lists for each field. Yeah, but it's got to decide what to do. If it's a primitive or computed, 
then it's going to include its name in the, in the, in the inside of the box. That only non-primitive fields are, are going to be drawn as lines, right? Those are the ones that are relations. And so it puts the field name and um, field key. It's, it's either a colon, a, a hash sign. So you can actually see it's got the hash sign here. That name is a type, is a key, and key is a, is a computed field. So if it's uh, got a, you know, some different things, and it's got the, the field dot type dot name. So it, it outputs the type name, which is the name of the primitive type or the class type if it's a computed field. And if it's computed, then it puts an equal sign on the end. It doesn't actually list the equation because that doesn't fit in a diagram very well, right? Code doesn't really look at very good in pictures. So this is a, a partial view of, uh, of a schema. And we can look at some other things that we can render with this uh, so that was the schema schema. We could also go and look at the grammar schema. And you'll see that looks quite different. What this says is that a grammar is a bunch of rules with a start rule. Okay. And the rules are have an argument a rule has a name and an argument. So that's basically the you know, names, colon, equals, pattern. And the argument is a pattern. And all these things here are all subclasses of pattern. So they all, and they all have various different arguments that point to it. And those are all traversal fields, because if you want to parse the grammar, uh, traverse every node in the grammar, you have to go down them. And uh, so, um, yeah, it's alt creates. So creates are the uh, the thing that create. They're in square brackets, and they have a name, which is the name of a schema element. And regulars are uh, star and plus and question mark, um, optional and boolean. And they have a separator, so you can actually parse, um, you know, a list of things with commas between them. But you can do that with arbitrary patterns in between, actually, if you wanted to, not just syntax, not just uh, uh, punctuation. Mm -hmm. And a sequence is a list of elements. And a rule, a call, is a call from one rule to another rule, right? Grammars refer to each other. Grammar rules refer to each other. So there's got to be a way to do that. And that's not a traversal rule because you don't need to do that, to follow that, to get to the, to the other rule. Um, and then there's a bunch of terminals. Um, including references, which I haven't really explained, but you could talk about them if you wanted to. And um, these you both use expressions, which are the same expressions that are imported okay, in the other. So we're, we're actually using expressions in three different ways, once in the data model, and then twice in here, once to talk about code. So code is, is implemented for conditions that can't be expressed um, so if we actually go and look at the grammar model, you'll see that there's some uh, sort of comp computation. So we do use the curly braces with computation, but those are only to disambiguate when you can't do it with parsing. So star sets optional to true and many to true question mark sets optional to true, plus sets many to true. And, you know, these things here are, I left out of the diagram there, they're for formatting. So you can render grammars back through this thing. You can render back through a grammar, and you get this exact text with line formatting and stuff if you add the right hints. So um, anyway, that's, that's uh, stencils. Um, there's a, there's a schema stencil, which is what we were looking at.
And um, so it renders boxes, and then it goes back and does the subclass links. So those are all the arrows. They have arrows, right, between the class and the superclass. For every superclass, it writes an arrow. And then it goes back through and does the field relationship. So it's got to say, well, it's got to be not computed. It's got to be not primitive. And the inverse, uh, uh, well, I guess there's some issue with the inverse here. It, it needs to, um, there's two fields. There's a field in this class and a field in that class. They can be inverses of each other. We don't want to draw the line twice. So it figures out, um, you know, one side or the other side to draw the line. And then it, then it actually draws a connector and it has to fill in a bunch of stuff. But basically, it's between the field owner and the field type. That's the, that's the relationship that it draws. So I guess I claim that that's you know, 36 lines of code that are the complete schema diagram editor with editing and writing back and everything. So the reason that works is that there's a whole file of Ruby code that re reads these schemas, reads these stencils, and does what they say, okay? So it's got an on click button and a on edit and all these different things. It's got selections, so you can select stuff and uh, move it. And it's written all that stuff, but I've only written that once. That's the same code for the editor for schemas as for the editor for state diagrams, right? It's exactly the same code. It's just reading a different specification of what's unique about this particular application. So I've managed to factor it so that I've got sort of the application logic written once, and it gets specialized to this particular stuff, which is designed to just specify what's unique about this application, just the unique parts. Everything that's common is left out. That's the idea of the design. So um, now let me show you one last thing that I did recently because um, I really, so you can look at the schema grammar, grammar grammar, grammar schema. They're all unique, interesting things. There's the expression grammar. That's the thing that gets loaded. Expression grammar, talked about diagrams, talked about stencils. We saw the stencil schema. So I want to talk about Excel. How much time do I have? Five minutes? Yeah. So Excel is one of my target applications. I'd love to be able to recreate tar Excel and replace it because Excel is crap, basically. It, it's, it's terrible for writing equations and applications, right? It's great for doodling around in, but anything serious, then you're going to get really fragile. So I actually... Uh, you know, inserting, I implemented a uh, uh, an Excel spreadsheet. I've done a couple in my life that are real serious that I use over and over again. And um, they are, like here's the one I use for grading my class. And I, I what I do is I import my grades with, these are fake student names, by the way. And I have, um, can you read that? No. <laughs> okay, you can't read that. That's fine. You can make it bigger. Um, Q, probably, Zoom. Let's go 200%. Okay, there we go. So, uh, so anyway, I've got my assignments across the top and my students along the left. And every time I do this, I have to change the, 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 the uh, well, let me just show you a little bit more about it. So what I do is I first normalize the grades to 100% by dividing by the maximum score of the assignment. And that gives me a second list. And these names are all um, equal. These are equal to the first. There's an equation that relates the names in this version with the original names. And these all have their own equations that normalize them. So there's hundreds of copies of the same equation. 
which any one of them could go wrong if you just accidentally delete it or whatever. Uh, and then it's got some computations that allow me to curve grades where, you know, if the, if the average is really low on an assignment, I'll curve it up just to make it more normalized and, and you know, deal with the problems that I had a bad assignment maybe. Um, and so I'm, I'm actually getting a bunch of computations here and then I'm curving it. So this is getting a 3% curve, this is getting a 12% curve, and um, you know, it takes it from an average of 70 to an average of 80, 80% 80 average. Eh, that's fine. So these are the curved grades. And these are, again, equations, hundreds of them. And then I uh, deal with combining the, the, the things together that there's different um, assignment classes like homeworks get combined at a certain percentage of the final grade and the midterm is combined in there. And so that gets computed as a contribution here, which is added up, and this is the final grade right here. that sums those things up. And that's what I do. And I have to redo this spreadsheet and make sure that I don't mess up my, any of my equations. And if I add a column or add a row, everything goes haywire, but I have to do that every time because everything is different, except the basic pattern is the same. So I wrote the basic pattern as a schema. I thought, well, I'll try and do that. Why not? And um, I ended up with this. So this is the biggest schema I've ever written, actually. And it says that a course has students and categories and assignments. And uh, a student has a bunch of grades and a final grade field. That's what actually gets computed for that student, right? And it's the sum of the grades dot combined. But the assignments have a bunch of computations over them because those are, everything gets, you know, kind of aggregated uh, in the assignment dimension. And then the grades compute, um, there's the actual grade that you type in, but it gets normalized and then curved and then combined. And so it's got multiple different computed fields. And so there's equations that say how to do that. And every equation is written once, okay? And um, so I'm able to, to run that thing. Oh boy. So it actually, um, reads in the CSV, loads it into the data model, and then prints out the answers here. And these are the same scores that I got out of Excel. But I just did it by running them through that data model with computed fields. And I didn't have to change my data model language at all. It, it actually is more powerful than, ex than SQL, for example, because it allows computed fields that depend on other computed fields that get computed like Excel does. You know, it finds things. So now I'm writing a stencil that uh, that's what I'm going to leave you with that will allow me to render those grades no data model as a bunch of grids and then it'll look just like my Excel spreadsheet but when I want to change it it'll be solid. I can add new rows, add new columns, it'll have the right, col have the right equations will always compute the right answer. That's, that's it. So anyway, that's it. Thank you. So help me out. I'm just doing this.